choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In 1962, JFK gave his famous speech, highlighting his vision and challenging the nation to land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. In doing so, he captured people's imagination and brought the country together around a powerful idea to achieve a goal that must have seemed impossible. That story has always been close to my heart because it ignited a passion for science for a whole generation. And we still see its effects today in a lot of entrepreneurs who grew up in that time, such as Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and others. My own passion for science growing up in the time when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched and the space shuttles flew and the beginning of the International Space Station led me to spend countless nights outside with my own small telescope under the clear skies of outback Australia and the countryside of southern France. It led me to pursue science studies knowing that one day I would contribute to major scientific breakthroughs. It turns out I never made it past the first year. But that passion stayed with me, and I became instead a science writer and communicator. And this led me to another powerful idea, one that winds through space and time and through Macclesfield, and which is bringing not just the country, but the world together. And in doing so, it is showing me that everyone can play a part in science. This powerful idea began with a seemingly simple question. What did the universe look like when the first stars and galaxies formed? But to answer it, we need to build not just a telescope, but a time machine. We need to look back 13 and a half billion years ago to the cosmic dawn. You see, astronomy is like archaeology. In archaeology, the further you dig, the more you go back in time. In astronomy, because light has a finite speed, the further you look, the more you go back in time. So we are essentially flipping back the pages in the book of the universe, back to one of the very first chapters. But flipping those pages comes with many challenges. And let me highlight just three of them for you today. To look back this far, we need to build something truly massive. And this is our first challenge, the scale. We have to build a telescope a hundred times the size of the nearby Lovell telescope at Jodrell Bank which is still today the world's third largest single dish. In a sense, we have to build a square kilometer of collecting area. We can't physically build something that big, otherwise this happens. So instead, we are making the most of increasingly sophisticated computing and building instead a network of smaller radio telescopes and connecting them together. We're building an array. And that is how the concept of the Square Kilometer Array, or SKA for short, was born. So if you think that the world's largest array of telescopes today is composed of 66 antennas, how many do you think we're building to look back to the early universe? 67? 90? 100? No, we're building 200. 200 dishes and 130,000 antennas spread over hundreds of kilometers in remote areas and connected together by no less than 100,000 kilometers of optical fiber. And the world's most powerful supercomputer by today's standards to process all of the data. We are basically skipping a generation of telescope. And this leads me to our second challenge, the challenge of data. All of these antennas are going to produce an incredible amount of data. Your internet provider provides you with a connection of 100 megabits per second at home, if you're lucky. We will be pumping out data at 10 million megabits per second. That is 100,000 times faster than your home broadband. And we'll be doing this 24-7, 365 days a year we will be producing 300 petabytes of science data every year. If you're not familiar with a petabyte, that represents roughly 300,000 average hard drives by today's standards. And we'll be doing this every year. That's a lot of hard drives. 
And if you think that a single image produced by this telescope will take a thousand hard drives, how do you send it to someone? Where do you store it? Not only that, but how do you process it? Because you see, we're not just storing data, we're doing things with the data. Data by itself is meaningless. What matters is the interpretation. We have to take this data and turn it into information that the astronomers can use to produce knowledge. And eventually this knowledge becomes wisdom for all of us. But sifting through so much data takes enormous computing resources. So you simply couldn't store all of this on your home computer or even researchers at their universities, let alone process it. To overcome this, we're literally having to change the way we do science. And how do we do this? By collaborating more, by working remotely, by using cloud storage, and by using a global alliance of supercomputers distributed around the world to help us process all of the data that will be produced by this telescope. And increasingly, the public is also playing its part by, for example, using their spare processing power when they're not using their laptops to help us crunch data, or helping us to identify objects and catalog them. We call this citizen science, and already today it is helping researchers around the world tackle everything from astronomy to genetics. And we will need all of this if we are to make sense of this deluge of data from the sky. And this leads me to our third challenge. With the scale and the amount of data we'll produce comes the demand. When you've got the biggest science instrument on the planet, everyone wants to have a go at it. The capabilities, the possibilities for research across numerous fields are almost endless. Our science book, which is a snapshot of the observations that our user community, the astronomers, would like to do, represents two volumes, 130 chapters, 1,200 contributors, and 2,000 pages of science, with Newton, Newton's apple for reference. Together, those volumes weigh 10 kilograms, and two volumes were needed because the printer couldn't bind more than 1,000 pages together. How do you deal with so much interest? There are only so many hours in a day or in a year, so we'll only be able to undertake the most promising of observations, and that's maybe 10% of them all. And some of them will require thousands of hours of time on the telescope. So to overcome this, astronomers are increasingly having to team together in ever bigger international teams to refine their methods, to share data, and to make the most of the time that will be allocated to them on the telescope. No country could build this machine on its own. The Square Kilometre Array project spans 20 countries, with 10 funding countries and another 10 contributing to development around the world. With the networks of telescope and the infrastructure in Australia, in South Africa, and the headquarters here in the UK at Jodrell Bank, where I am based. One observatory operating two networks of telescopes across three continents. Over a thousand scientists and engineers spread across 20 time zones are working hard to make this a reality. And why not all 24 time zones, you might ask? Well, the only reason is because four of those time zones fall over the Pacific, and sadly, we don't have any offices there. And just think for a second how hard it is to schedule conference calls that suit everyone. So it is worth saying at this point that in an age of budget cuts, fake news and growing isolationism, it is reassuring to see that this vision to look back to the early universe is inspiring so many countries to work together, to fund this machine and to trust in science. But our legacy will go beyond just science. By working with industry, we are create to develop the cutting-edge technology we need, we are creating opportunities for spin-offs to emerge. And who knows what we'll come up with along the way. A young engineer in India or China might develop the next Wi-Fi, which I hope you all know was actually developed by radio astronomers. Well, now you do. You would be amazed by how many useful things we've come up with in our quest to explore 
the final frontier. In my work, I've been privileged to see firsthand the impact of the funding that comes as a result of the SK in local communities to train the next generation of scientists and engineers. I've traveled the world from Canada to China, from Sweden to South Africa, and I've met hundreds of those engineers and scientists who are building this incredible machine to make sense of our place in the universe. I have met some of the politicians who choose to believe in them and to fund them. And I've met some of the teachers who inspire kids with their stories. The spark it lights in those people cannot be extinguished. And so perhaps our bigger legacy, going back to JFK, is that with this vision, we are igniting that same passion, that same drive to outdo ourselves, to pursue something bigger than ourselves, and to pursue it together. And as JFK then said, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because by that goal, we measure the best of our energies and skills. So my message here today is that science isn't just scientists. It takes engineers, it takes politicians, it takes teachers, enthusiasts, and the public at large to work. And as I've learned, everybody can play a part, even someone who never finished their science degree. The most important element is your passion. TEDx is about ideas worth sharing. What the SK shows us is that when big enough ideas are shared and enough people rally behind them, they eventually become reality and inspire others. And that's how you change the world. Thank you.